everyone. Welcome back to another Q&A. We're joined with Murray as we've continued uh, our Roman series. Uh, Murray, just a lot to wrestle with. Uh, if Luther wrestled with it, I think it's fair to say that we kind of wrestle with the balance of, <laughs> yes. of God's righteousness and how it's applied uh, to our lives. But uh, before we kind of get into it, why don't you remind the listeners of your sermon? Romans 1, 16 and 17. I said it is, it is the verse in which church history has turned, on which church history has turned, because depending on how you interpret the phrase, the righteousness of God, you'll either hate God or love God. Now, I, I say that a little bit uh, in hyperbole, but, 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 but maybe not, because a legalistic interpretation of the righteousness of God means that we've got to earn our way to God by doing right things. And that's where Martin Luther was prior to um, prior to the Holy Spirit's opening his eyes to see that what is meant primarily in the verse, the righteousness of God, is the righteousness by which uh, God gives to his people. Uh, so he not just uh, defines himself as his characteristic, but the righteousness by which God gives to his people. And so we talked about, uh, we talked about the offense of the gospel. We talked about the power of the gospel, that the righteousness of God being applied to us has power as it is working in our lives to make us more and more like Christ. And we talked about the result. So the opposite of being ashamed of the gospel is eager anticipation, eager thankfulness for all that God's done on our behalf. How would you help someone who is wrestling with you know, God's righteousness, the standard, it's been applied to me, but I'm still struggling. I feel like he's got to lose his patience for me. Uh, so how, how would you help some with that healthy balance of understanding like we're si sinners in need of a savior, but we also have a savior. Mm. A phrase that comes to mind is, um, one that I've read and I don't, I don't recall where, but it says God is good and he's good enough to share his righteousness with us. I think that we put limits on God's patience for forgiveness because we have limits to our patience to forgive other people. And we can't imagine that God would have infinite mercy. Well, surely there has to be an end to it. Surely we've got to disappoint him. Surely by all the things that we continue to do, it's, it's got to turn his heart cold toward us. But the Bible, let the Bible be its own witness for God's own heart, mm -hmm. that God is uh, eager to save lost sinners, that he delights in drawing us near, that our sin causes God to hug us harder to his heart rather than repel us from him. Yeah, that's an interesting point on the limits that we project onto God. And before we started recording, we were talking about how uh, when I was up in Chicago and you're standing at the um, shore of Lake Michigan and you're like, this is really a big lake. Yes. Uh, now, if I was describing the lake, if I was saying, yeah, I went up to Lake Michigan to my children who have only seen uh, the lakes in Alabama, they would in their mind picture a body of water that they could see across. Right but would completely undervalue and undermine the actual sheer vastness yeah. that Lake Michigan looks like the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, that's a great the, example. Um, and so uh, what might be some verses to help people um, not put a limit? Mm. Um, Boy, uh, well, what immediately comes to mind is seven chapters later when Paul says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, you think about, I mean, we've been talking about Dane Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly, uh, where Jesus describes his own heart towards wayward sinners when he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for your souls. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Mm -hmm. And the, the understanding and application of what it means for God's heart to be drawn towards, towards his people. Um, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses in Hebrews. They're, they're, you know, just Scripture is just replete with um, 
Example after example after example of God's never-ending mercy. God's own self-disclosure to the Israelites um, as they were, uh, to Moses rather, as um, he's described himself as a God who is showing steadfast love to thousands and thousands and generations of those who love him. So Yeah, I mean, you know, the reality is if you were to continue just reading Scripture, you're going to continue to run in to the, the limitlessness of God's of grace. Uh, to close out, what, what have you found, or maybe what would you tell someone is maybe one of the greatest joys of there not being a limit to God's grace? Um, it gives me freedom to say what I, what I have either done or thought is wrong. It gives it gives free uh, freedom to confess sin because you know you think about it in any kind of other relationship. I'm going to share if if I've done something wrong against you, John, then I will share. Only insofar as I think you're willing to accept it or hear it. Yeah. And so the same is with God. We, we think, okay, well, if God's only willing, if his mercy is only this much or this much or this much, then I've got freedom to share however much is going to fill that mercy bucket. And then yeah, that's it. To the limit. Right. Share to the limit. But... Um, as, as great as Lake Michigan is, God's mercy is even more. And it, it, gives, it gives freedom for confession, knowing that God is uh, merciful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, I just got encouraged. Oh, so good. That, <laughs> maybe you uh, will too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, as always, thank you for listening. Uh, We would love to hear from you if you have any questions that maybe you heard from a sermon uh, or just a topic in general. Uh, But thank you. Uh, Thank you for listening.